welcome. Yeah, sure. Just a reminder for everyone, Professor Chai will have close 40 minutes of presentation and continue with 20 minutes of Q&A. If you have questions, you can go to the participant buttons. There's a right hand buttons there. You could raise your hand and ask question directly during the Q&A. Or you can type the question in the chat box and I will ask them for you at the Q&A station. So Professor Chai, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and let you go ahead and share your screen. Sounds good. Please. Mm -hmm. Can you see my slide? Yes. Perfect. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I'm very happy and honored to be here and share with you my research um, on the charging infrastructure planning for shared mobility and autonomous vehicle adoption. And uh, I will uh, focus on what we did for uh, this particular uh, research project. And then towards the end, uh, I will also share with you a very brief um, idea about the, uh, some of the other projects our research group is working on. So um, there are three revolutions that are currently happening in urban transportation. Um, there's the shared mobility side. Um, so uh, if you have used Uber, you might have noticed that they have a Uber similar for other um, lift pool option as well. If we really look at um, when you're driving on the road, if you look around, we see a lot of single occupant vehicles. The average car occupancy rate in the US is 1.6. So there is a lot of uh, uh, potential to put more people into the same car to make the transportation system more efficient. And the way to do it is called ride sharing or um, ride pooling. So specifically, if we look into a dynamic ride pooling services, um, let's say if we have maybe three taxi trips um, colored in different lines, Potentially, uh, if we have an efficient matching algorithm, we can uh, route the same vehicle to pick up multiple person um, and deliver them one by one along the same route because they're kind of going into the same direction. So right pooling provides a lot of uh, um, opportunities to improve the transportation sustainability. Um, so this is from the sharing side. If we also think about... Um, um, the autonomous driving side, right? autonomous vehicle has been developing uh, rapidly as well. There's a lot of uh, uh, different debates and projection on when are we going to have large scale autonomous vehicle adoption. Uh, we expect autonomous vehicles will improve the road safety and help reduce the fleet size of the vehicles we have because they're um, 24 by seven availability and if they are level five require no driver. Uh, but for sure, uh, we know that the adoption of it, uh, autonomous vehicles will be slowly um, increasing. They're not going to happen overnight that all the vehicles will be autonomous. Right? So we will have this adoption phase. Uh, similarly, uh, for electric vehicles, um, they have also received a lot of attention because they have no zero, uh, no tailpipe emissions, um, but because of the, uh, the amount of charging time required, uh, uh, their adoption has also been slow as well, but we know the trend is that uh, electric vehicle um, is getting more and more adoption over time. So if we think about um, these three things that are happening kind of individually, there's a lot of uh, integration as well. So specifically coming from the electric vehicle side, because I know this um, seminar theorists have a theme on electrification. So let's dive in from the EV side. If we look at what would be the life cycle of a vehicle, let's say a conventional gasoline vehicle, uh, from the life cycle perspective, uh, we have the, 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 uh, the vehicle cycle and also the fuel cycle. The vehicle cycle is the material uh, manufacturing, material extraction uh, to produce all the parts, engine to make the vehicles. And then the fuel cycle is the extraction of the gasoline, fossil fuel, uh, gasoline refining, transporting to the gas station and then pump the vehicle. So when we're really evaluating the environmental impacts of transportation, 
we can't just look at the use phase. We needed to take this life cycle perspective and look um, both upstream and downstream in terms of material recycling as well. Now, when we want to change this um, into an electric vehicle system, um, the benefit is that we will be able to diversify our fuel sources. 90% um, of the, the fossil fuel is used for transportation. Right? But if we switch to electric vehicles, um, the electricity will be able to uh, be generated from a diverse sources from nuclear hydro to solar wind, um, et cetera. Um, and uh, um, one more modification we need to consider is the manufacturing of uh, batteries um, in this life cycle model. Um, but very often one thing people uh, forget is for an EV system compared to the conventional gasoline vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles, a key difference is we also needed to consider the impact of travel patterns because different travel pattern will change how people adopt and use their electric vehicles, which will impact how the vehicle is used. So by travel pattern, I mean um, what time you will be taking the trip uh, from where, which location to which location. Travel pattern is important for EV adoption because um, number one, um, depending on where you go, there may or may not be charging infrastructure for you to charge the vehicle before you can come back. Right. And also depending on where you're going and how long is your trip, you will need um, different battery size vehicle to serve your uh, travel demands. Right. If you need to go uh, into a remote area for a long trip with no charging infrastructure, right, the people will need a larger uh, battery size to, to make the trip. On the other hand, if we're using a PHEV, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, which will allow you to first use electricity in the battery and then gasoline in the fuel tank, um, then uh, the travel pattern will determine really uh, how much of your miles will be traveled on electricity versus on gasoline. Um, that will translate into how much uh, of the carbon emission reduction benefits we can really gain uh, from the, adopting the EVs. So travel pattern matters. Another thing that matters significantly is the charging infrastructure. So charging infrastructure has been um, developing rapidly around the world. And uh, um, if we look at the numbers, the number of charging stations is really increasing. But the question is also, are we, citing, are, are we installing them at the right places? Uh, this is a picture in Beijing because of the location of the charging station, um, it's hard to get access to. Um, you can see it's empty, nobody's using it. Right. When we are um, increasing our EV adoption, uh, we also needed to increase um, our EV charging infrastructure. So it's important for us uh, to plan for the EV charging infrastructure to serve um, the, the charging demands rather than just to have the coverage. So if we really think about when we plan for a charging infrastructure, um, electric vehicle is uh, very different from refueling in terms of the amount of time you have to spend on charging. So charging are less likely to happen along the road, right? It's not something that you would do uh, on my way to work, I would charge my vehicle, like how you would fuel your vehicle. Um, it's more likely to happen uh, either at home or at the destination, for example, shopping center or uh, parking spots uh, at work, for example. So that is based on if we just have EV adoption, these are the key factors to consider when we uh, plan for charging infrastructure. However, if we think about the three revolutions that we have just mentioned about, um, they actually have interactions we need to consider as well. Um, for example, for autonomous vehicles, uh, because now uh, with level five, uh, vehicles, uh, no human driver is required, um, they will actually make the charging schedule and the location more flexible because one key barrier for EV adoption is the charging time. So people are concerned about uh, running out of range or have to uh, spend the actual work to charge the vehicle. Now, if we can send the vehicle to charge itself and come back to pick you up, 
right? EV adoption will be promoted and how we plan for charging infrastructure will also be different. And on the other hand side, um, if we think about ride pooling or ride sharing, um, basically ride pooling is to chain the different trips. If we think about private vehicle, um, 90% of the, the, the time our vehicle is parked. The parking time can be used for charging. However, if we have right pooling, let's say we chain the, the trips of um, four people together, right? The vehicle will have a lot of uh, uh, trip time and their parking time will be reduced. And where they will be parked will also be changed. And that they need to be accounted for uh, when we are planning for charging infrastructure as well. And similarly, when we have more and more EV adoption, if we are using electric autonomous shared vehicles to serve our travel demand uh, in the city, uh, the EV battery size and charging infrastructure will also impact the service availability for the AVs um, and the ride sharing, uh, basically whether the shared electric autonomous vehicle is available uh, to pick up another trip depends on whether this vehicle has enough uh, electricity to serve that trip or not. Right? And also there's uh, research showing that having an autonomous fleet uh, with sharing will be able to reduce the fleet size um, to serve the same demand. Right? That will also be linked into if that fleet is electric fleet, uh, what's the battery range and how does the reduced fleet size impact our charging infrastructure? So putting it all together, um, that is the motivation for this research is uh, we needed to consider these three trends that are happening um, individually, but they can have interdependencies. Um, they are developing at different rates, but at any time they could be combined together, right? We could have uh, um, electric vehicle that are not autonomous. Um, they are human driver, but we're using them for sharing. Right? We could have uh, electric autonomous vehicle that's privately owned that is not used for sharing. Right? Or we can have the combined um, shared autonomous electric vehicles uh, centrally managed to serve all the demands in the city as well. So how would the different pathways will impact our charging infrastructure development is the question that this research aim to study. If we look at uh, when we plan for charging station siting, um, there are some key elements we needed to include in the model. So number one is we needed to optimize the location, um, the number of the charging station, and also how many charging ports each station has um, integrated, right? All three things will uh, impact our charging infrastructure capability. And also, as we have discussed, um, the adoption of electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle, they're not going to happen overnight. So it's possible that uh, they, the, the adoption will increase slowly. And we're not going to build the charging infrastructure for 100% adoption today overnight um, as well, right? So it's more likely that adoption of autonomous ve uh, of electric vehicles and the in installation of the charging infrastructure uh, will happen gradually at, uh, uh, with, uh, which will promote each other and they will um, fully develop over a multi-period uh, development process. And one more thing is when we have existing charging infrastructure, um, when we um, gradually develop this charging infrastructure based on what we have previously, we have a decision to make. Um, do we expand the current charging station with more ports uh, or uh, do we actually build new stations? That's a trade-off we need to make. So as shown in this figure here, um, if let's say if we have uh, two charging stations, um, these uh, charging demands are a little bit far from these charging stations, right? Uh, when we actually introduce a new charging station, right? Essentially, um, some of the, the, the vehicles will be closer to this charging station. The new charging station could be more expensive than just to expand uh, the, the charging capability at the existing stations. 
So there's trade-offs depending on how the existing charging infrastructure is located with the additional charging demand. One more thing to consider is also queuing at charging stations. Uh, some of the existing models also assume unlimited capability at the charging spot, um, but potentially with increasing EV adoption, um, there will be waiting time for the, the vehicle to wait until the charging ports to become available, right? In that case, um, would we be able to use the same budget, but um, adding two ports at the existing uh, charging station rather than build one new charging station, but with less number of ports, which one would be a better choice? And how do we, uh, how, how has the, the queuing uh, behavior impacted the, the, uh, the waiting time of the uh, vehicle charging? And one last thing is very often, um, these models need to consider a limited budget because building charging infrastructure is very expensive. So um, considering in the context of the existing literature uh, from the optimization of the station location and number of uh, charging ports, considering queuing at the station and a multi-development uh, period, um, and also considering the uh, ride sharing and autonomous vehicle adoption, um, so this, uh, this paper we published on uh, transportation research part D is trying to uh, consider all these factors together. So now one question um, that makes this task challenging is that charging and EV adoption and use, they are chicken and egg problem, right? We don't know where to charge um, until we have the location of the charging station ready. Then we can make the decision. Right. But we can't make the decision if we don't know uh, where people are going to charge. Um, so without knowing the charging behavior, um, providing the optimum charging uh, station plan is challenging. Right. So how do we resolve this interdependency problem? Uh, the, our approach is to uh, propose um, uh, agent-based model uh, integrated with uh, optimization model solved by genetic algorithm. So you don't need to look at the details for now. Um, what I'm trying to show is that we have uh, uh, two major models. Uh, one is uh, uh, Asian based model that I will explain in more details later that we'll, we will use to generate the charging demand. And then uh, we will use that information to uh, generate some good initial solutions that we will feed into our genetic algorithm model um, to evaluate how good these uh, uh, siting plans are uh, serving the existing charging demand. And then um, we will uh, produce some uh, genetic operations and then um, uh, refine um, the next generation of charging candidates that we will send back to the agent-based model to evaluate their performance. And then we will do this iteratively um, to, to improve the uh, objective function over uh, time. And uh, I will explain each of the components uh, in more details. So first of all, let's talk about this agent-based model. So we needed to uh, model the system um, to, we, we needed to, in order to evaluate the system, we need a model that we can capture these charging decision, um, the, uh, the vehicle picking up riders, rider sharing rides with each other. So we use agent-based model because uh, it's a bottom-up approach that will allow us uh, to account for the individual heterogeneity in terms of waiting time um, and uh, 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 different vehicle fleet size, et cetera. So our model has two types of agents. Uh, one is the riders, one is the taxis. We have some global parameter. Uh, basically, we will model the, um, uh, the system in terms of a real world city uh, case study. And then we will have some uh, historical trip data that we use as the travel demands for the riders. Uh, we have some rider type. Um, so um, in our model, we have five type of rider, basically um, someone who may not want to share rides with others at all, uh, all the way to someone who only want to share the rides with others if they're going to take the taxi. Um, 
basically these writers could be highly uh, price sensitive. And then we have someone who may not be, um, may not care about whether I'm sharing with others or not, and someone in the middle as well. So in this specific study, we um, have some simplification on the writer side. Uh, we only include uh, writers who are um, either are willing to share or they are not willing to share the rise with the others, right? depending on uh, the trip purpose. Uh, some people may not consider writing, uh, write sharing with the others because you're in a hurry, um, while the others may be okay to share. Um, but then, then everyone will have different sharing tolerance. Uh, basically, share the rise with the others will require a certain amount of detour. So um, if you're taking the trip by yourself, uh, you can be delivered immediately. But if you're sharing the rise with others, um, then you might have to wait uh, for the, the other people to be uh, dropped off before you can be dropped off. So here we have a, a distribution that we assign to each writer to represent how much of an additional uh, trip length that they are willing to consider uh, for their sharing. If uh, the sharing exceeds their tolerance, then they will not accept this uh, sharing request. And then on the fleet size, uh, on the vehicle size, uh, we can uh, determine how many vehicles we model in the system. Are they uh, EVs or are they autonomous vehicles or are they both? And also we can determine uh, where uh, we, we put in the location of the charging stations um, that will come from the genetic algorithm uh, side. And then for each uh, writers, they have some individual parameters um, and for text, uh, for the vehicles, um, they also have some uh, individual uh, parameters in terms of their vehicle type and also capacity. So uh, more specifically, if we look into how the agents are making decisions, um, so first of all, we initialize the model based on which the, the case study city, the historical travel demand, and uh, the, uh, the number of vehicles and the number of riders we have. And then depending on whether we're modeling the rider uh, or the taxis, uh, if we're modeling the riders, uh, they have some rules they follow that if they are available, um, they will search for a ride. Um, uh, if they get matched with the taxi, um, then we, they will wait for the taxi to pick the rider up. And then uh, if they have been picked up by the taxi, uh, they will wait, uh, to, they, they will travel with the taxi until being dropped off. Um, if they get dropped off, then they record their information and exit the system. Um, if they are uh, haven't been dropped off, then they will be uh, evaluating um, uh, sharing requests along the way uh, based on their uh, remaining tolerance levels. So in this model, we're using a dynamic ride sharing. Uh, basically, you could uh, always uh, deviate um, during any time along the road to pick up additional riders. And then on the vehicle side uh, for the taxi, uh, because they could be electric, uh, so if they are an uh, electric vehicle, uh, they will check whether they need charging or not. If they need charging, which means that their uh, um, SOC state of charge is below a certain uh, threshold, then they will go to the nearest charging station to charge. Um, and then if they do not need charging, um, they will evaluate whether there are nearby writer requests that they can serve. Um, if there are requests, they will uh, uh, add the request to their uh, uh, route list to, to, to pick up the, uh, the passenger. And then if they are charging, um, if the battery is full, then they become available and consider additional rides. Um, if they're partially full, the battery is partially full, uh, when the battery um, state of charge exceeds a certain um, preset level, uh, we will allow the, the vehicle to re uh, receive requests so they don't have to be fully charged. If there's a nearby request that, that they can serve, um, they will also be available to pick up that uh, rider um, and serve that trip. So some key assumptions we made here um, that I'd like to highlight um, uh, a couple of them. So one thing is in this model, we only include the two types of writer, uh, either share, allow sharing or don't allow sharing. And they have some uh, uh, 
individual uh, lifespan parameters in terms of how long they will uh, wait in the system before uh, being matched with the taxi before they choose to leave the service system unserved. Uh, or, uh, uh, and also uh, how much of a deviation tolerance they have for detour. And the EVs will always go to the nearest, nearest charging station to charge. Um, this is one of the limitations of the study that can be improved in the future because they, they could make more uh, smarter decisions in terms of if the nearest one is crowded and has a queue, maybe a one that a little bit further away has available spots that I can go to the other one. But right now in this model, uh, we are only using the nearest charging station um, to evaluate this queuing behavior. And then um, for uh, traditional vehicles, so our model has both traditional and autonomous vehicles. Uh, so for the traditional taxis, they have the sh on shift and off shifts time because uh, uh, the drivers will not be able to drive 24 hours. So we include this uh, modeling of shifts and we also assume that for a traditional electric vehicle, they will have access to a home charging when the vehicle is off shift. So the, uh, the thought behind that is the driver will be able to drive the vehicle uh, back home or back to the company's uh, centrally managed uh, charging spot uh, to charge the vehicle using slow charging. And then um, the travel speed in the system is based on his, uh, historical average uh, trip speed. So the case study we used in this study, uh, in this research, um, is based on New York City's uh, taxi trip records. Um, so uh, we picked New York City as the case study uh, because they have a lot of trip, uh, which uh, provides a lot of uh, sharing benefits. And if we look at the number of passengers on each trip, so basically, uh, we, we have the record of each taxi trip in terms of the time of the trip. Uh, the pickup location, the drop-off location, and how many people are traveling together on that taxi ride. So majority of the trips are by uh, one person, uh, some by two. So consider a, a vehicle with four seats. Uh, there's also a lot of potential to, uh, to, uh, to, to share rides with the others. And also uh, many of the trips, so this is Manhattan. Uh, if you're familiar with the map of New York City, so a lot of the trips are concentrated in Manhattan um, area, uh, which make them has the, the, the trip density to allow a lot of the sharing because there's a lot of trip uh, starting at the same time and going to the same direction. So if we look at the how many trips we have over a, a day, um, you can see that we have about a morning peak and a, a evening peak, and the evening peak is higher than um, the morning peak. So the simulation day we used is uh, May 7th, uh, 2014. We used the 2014 data because that was before all the Uber and the Lyft, the, the ride hailing service started. Um, so we think the, 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 the older historical data has a more complete representativeness of the, the taxi demands in the city before the competition of those services. And the average number of cars, average number of taxi uh, in the city has some fluctuation because of the shifts uh, I mentioned earlier. And we used this curve to uh, benchmark our model to have this shifting in and out behavior. So this is on the simulator side. Now let's take a look on the optimization side. So um, the candidate location we considered are all the uh, parking location in New York City. So each of the dot is one parking uh, location in the city. And the New York City has uh, a very good uh, data, open data sharing platform where we can access the location and the capacity of all the parking location, um, um, parking garage, parking plots um, in New York City. So this is our candidate set uh, on where we want to build the charging capability. Again, because we mentioned the charging is more likely to happen at the, the trip destination. So when the car is parked, that's why we are using uh, parking uh, location candidate set. And our objective is to minimize the time people have to spend on charging tasks. Um, the time will include two parts. 
Uh, one part is if you have to wait at a char charging station, wait in the queue, um, the waiting time is what we consider as uh, wasted time. And then it's also this uh, uh, detour time, uh, driving from where you currently are um, to the charging station and then uh, back. Right here, we made some simplification saying the vehicle will probably have to come back to where they were, uh, while in the model, really, it's possible that they could uh, uh, be matched to another ride and travel directly from the, uh, the charging station. Right here, we just assume it's a round trip from their original uh, location to, to better estimate this uh, uh, detour effects. And uh, uh, the constraints we considered um, include that uh, for the, um, the candidates are from the parking lots, um, any of the old charging station location from the previous planning horizon uh, cannot be moved. So our assumption is that uh, building charging station is very expensive. So uh, we want to keep building, uh, keep expanding based on what we have so far, and uh, we cannot just uh, very easily move them around um, uh, in the next time spot. Right? So it's kind of a, a represent an expansion uh, process. And we also consider the parking lot capacity in terms of really how many parking spots we have, and that will be the maximum uh, uh, charging uh, uh, charging pots that uh, 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 we can install at that station. And then we also have some uh, budget in terms of uh, uh, how, how many uh, charging station we can install. And uh, here we made an assumption in terms of uh, the cost of uh, a new station uh, versus old station. Um, so we assume that uh, the building one new station, the cost is equivalent to expanding, um, adding two new ports at an old station. Right? This is um, a, a little bit uh, kind of a, a more simplified uh, um, uh, consideration on the price side. Um, this model could be improved in terms of considering more of the, the cost of uh, you know, the land price, um, the existing uh, power infrastructure in terms of providing the electricity, et cetera. So here we, we, we uh, had a simpler uh, price representation and did some sensitivity analysis in terms of the impact of the, uh, the relative cost and the budget. So um, the, um, with a little bit more information on exactly how do we solve uh, for this problem, right? we use the agent-based model um, to generate the demand. So first of all, uh, we talked about this interdependency in terms of if we don't know the charging demand, how do we optimize it? But if we don't know where are the charging stations, how, how do we know where do we need to charge or when do we need to charge? So the way we approach this problem is we use our um, candidate set. Let's say we have an uncons unconstrained charging evaluating model. So we assume, let's say, every single parking lot has charging capability with unlimited capacity. Um, in that ideal world, let's run the model, run the agent-based model to find out in the constrained um, scenario, where would the vehicle like to charge? And we use that initial demand um, to generate our um, candidate uh, population for the first round to initialize the, 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 the model uh, on the genetic algorithm side. So uh, basically, uh, we run the agent-based model uh, allowing the vehicle to visit any of the existing uh, candidate uh, parking lot station uh, when they need to charge, right? The, when they need to charge, basically uh, two things may uh, make them need to charge. One thing is their state of charge is too low um, and they have to charge. And number two is um, their, their state of charge is relatively low, it's not critically low, they don't have to charge. But since there's no uh, service request and they are close to a charging station, they might as well use the waiting time to charge their vehicle while they're waiting for a request uh, during the off-peak time. Okay, so we just want the vehicles to tell us ideally where do you want to charge. 
So we run the agent-based model and record every single time when the vehicle wants to charge and the ideal amount of uh, energy they would like to charge at that location. And then uh, we use their, uh, uh, we use um, their uh, charging demand uh, information to build our initial um, charging um, population candidate. So basically uh, where we have the charging demand, uh, where the vehicle realize, oh, I would like to charge, right? Um, they may not be at a close by charging station, right? Because we want to evaluate the, this travel time as well. So we record the moment where the, the vehicle feel that I, I want to, I have a charging demand. And then considering each dot as a charging demand um, and the available uh, candidate set, we then did a clustering um, to assign those charging demand to a nearby uh, charging uh, parking lot and use that um, as our initial um, uh, population set to initialize um, the, the, uh, the objective function evaluation in terms of, okay, this uh, parking lot can serve uh, this many charging demand. And then we use this um, kind of a, a rough estimation of the objective function um, to evaluate the candidate set and then uh, generate the initial parent site um, that we will further operate uh, some genetic uh, operations and then refine um, the candidate evaluation site. And then when we have a better next generation of uh, um, uh, charging station candidate location, we then feed it back into our agent-based model uh, to really place into the location of the charging station to let the simulation model evaluate how good the performance of these uh, candidate locations are. Okay. So um, it may be a little bit hard to visualize, so let me give you some example. Let's say each of the dots are one of the, the, uh, the uh, charging demand. So there was a vehicle, when the vehicle was here, um, it has some charging demand. Okay. So, um, and we have some uh, uh, green triangles representing the, uh, the, the, the uh, parking lot. Right. So uh, let's say if in a scenario we want to uh, place one charging station um, in this region, right, we, we can first cluster, or maybe let's use the two as an example. Let's say we want to put two charging station in, right? So we can do a clustering, um, um, uh, put the, the demand into two clusters, and then we find the center of the cluster, which is represented by the star here. Um, and then we snap it to the closest charging, uh, closest parking lot. So we say, okay, this parking lot will be uh, serving the demand of these uh, blue dots uh, charging demand. And this one will serve the demand of the green dots. And then uh, we evaluate how many uh, charging pots they, they would need, right? So um, in our chromosome, let's say we have 10 station, uh, 10 candidates here, right? So this one is number three. So uh, we're putting, okay, maybe you need five ports. This one maybe you need three ports, okay? And we could do this for different number of charging stations, and we could uh, uh, have different uh, clusterings. So we have different uh, number of uh, 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 different cluster center and different uh, uh, different capacity uh, to generate this initial uh, candidate set. And then uh, we can perform um, some genetic operation. So basically, for each line, each chromosome. Um, is how many charging ports we have at this candidate location. If it's zero, means we're not installing charging station at this location. And this number here um, is the objective function based on um, the charging demand and uh, the, the distance from the charging demand to the, uh, to the, the, the assigned charging location. So uh, we could do some uh, uh, perturbation in terms of moving the numbers. Uh, we could uh, do some fusion or fusion combining the station together. Uh, we could have some crossover uh, changing the chromosomes or we could have some uh, uh, mutation. Um, and then uh, basically we could uh, then do the evaluation again um, to generate the, the best fit uh, population for um, more rigorous evaluation using the simulation model 
uh, and then pass it back to do the next round of uh, genetic uh, algorithm uh, solution. So um, now let's uh, take a look at our uh, uh, scenarios and then also the results. So um, the research questions we want to uh, answer really is uh, um, um, both how do EVs uh, affect the autonomous uh, sharing of shared autonomous vehicles and also uh, sharing uh, ride sharing use non-autonomous vehicles, traditional taxis, and also um, how would the charging demand be different and how would the different demand impact the, 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 uh, the demand, electricity demand on, uh, from the grid. So we evaluated the three uh, adoption pathways so we have a future adoption pathway, which um, in this case, all the vehicles will be autonomous. So uh, it's autonomous vehicles, but the EV adoption will be slower than the uh, autonomous vehicle adoption. So uh, initially we have 10% uh, of the autonomous vehicles are electric, and then it will become 40%, 70%, and eventually 100%. Uh, we would also have a more of a present um, scenario, which is the autonomous vehicle development is lagging behind the EV adoption uh, scenarios. So we will have uh, human driving um, uh, uh, electric vehicles at 10%, 40%, 70%, and 100%. So this is uh, only EV adoption. Um, then we can also have a, a mixed case uh, where we started with only EV adoption, but in the middle, autonomous vehicle really picked up. Um, so we could have then switched into autonomous vehicle with 70% and 100% uh, uh, EV adoption. So here um, we uh, evaluated the, the fleet size uh, differently. So when we have a human driving vehicles, um, we would need more vehicles. Um, and when we switch to autonomous driving, because um, the vehicle will become available 24 seven, right, the fleet size to serve the same demand uh, can be reduced. So this figure shows based on some previous research, um, the traditional taxi fleet is about um, 13,500 taxis. Uh, but if they are autonomous and uh, with ride sharing, uh, we only need about uh, 5,500 of the vehicles to provide the same service uh, rate of all the, the, the number of trips that can be served. So that's why we have the fleet size um, of the, the, uh, the human driver vehicles being this many and the autonomous vehicles being this many. Um, so let me move to this one. Yeah. So um, remember, we generated the, the initial charging demand based on, on constrained charging. Uh, one interesting result we find is depending on whether it's autonomous and shared versus traditional, um, the unconstrained charging demand is very different. Um, the, the traditional one is more concentrated um, after midnight when the vehicle uh, shifts out. And then uh, when it's um, uh, autonomous driving, um, it's more spread out, not only spatially, but also temporally as well. So if we look at the, uh, where we build the charging uh, stations, um, this is the future uh, scenario. This is the present scenario. So autonomous, uh, shared autonomous one, um, current one, you can see the shared autonomous one will require more uh, spread out smaller charging stations while the, the current one has more centralized development. So um, uh, if we look at their objective function, um, the, the future one uh, has uh, lower uh, wasted time because of the spread out development. So uh, this results show that with different adoption pathways of the three technologies, the infrastructure development will be um, different. So I see we're maybe a little bit uh, short of time. So I'm gonna um, skip this one and talk about this one. Yeah. So the, um, if we also look into the environmental impact trends um, of different cases, right? Because of the, the, uh, the 
different charging scenarios and the, the different uh, mileage related to serving the rise and the charging, um, the emission um, generated, the carbon emission generated from the system uh, will also be different as well. So here, one interesting thing is for the mixed case, we really switched directly from the, the, the present line to the future line with not uh, too much change. And the reason was because the budget we set for this uh, um, project is sufficient to build the charging infrastructure to serve all demands. Uh, if the budget is more constrained, then we can see more of the difference here. Okay, um, so um, so we um, so basically the optimum uh, charging station siting doesn't have major impacts on the environmental uh, uh, emission side. Okay, so one last thing I want to show is uh, also the uh, the, the power uh, requirement from the grid will also be different given the different cases, right? So the prevalent one, because more centralized charging, we will see higher demand here, while the, the, the future pathway will have more um, uh, during the day charging. So, um, so some conclusion, I will skip this one. Uh, so one last thing I want to mention is we talk about a case where um, the vehicles are used as a centrally uh, managed uh, taxi system. But if the vehicles is privately adopted, um, their use and charging demand will also be different. So there's a lot of future work that can be done here um, as well. So um, new mobility has a lot of uh, potential that can improve environmental uh, impacts of the transportation sector. But um, there's still a lot of research that's needed. And uh, uh, so uh, my research uh, group uh, focused not only on the autonomous vehicle side, but also some of the shared mobility uh, uh, systems as well. So with that, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Sorry to go over a little bit. No, it's okay. I think we are in the Q&A station right now. So everyone, if you have questions, please, you can go uh, raise your hand or put it in the chat box. Uh, I saw one from Professor Kuntu. Thank you, Professor Tsai, for the, the very informative uh, presentation. This is really enlightening. I, I have a question uh, related to the objective function of your of your uh, problem, right? I wonder which stakeholder would you envision solving this problem? Uh, it's a service oriented kind of um, decision, right? So I, I was wondering how would you anticipate the system to work and who would be making the charging infrastructure deployment decisions in this type of uh, model? That's a great question. So um, in this model specifically, uh, we are thinking about a uh, centrally managed uh, taxi service, right? It's dedicated charging infrastructure for the taxi. So um, it could be the, uh, the, the, the uh, fleet manager, fleet uh, operators that they are developing these charging infrastructure. So they will have the motivation say, because I want my fleet to be efficient. So I don't want the fleet to waste the time uh, waiting in the queue or um, uh, uh, travel with no, you know, no riders in the vehicle just for charging. So this could be their perspective. And potentially, if we think about more from a city's perspective, uh, city planners may also have the, the same um, consideration in terms of uh, maximizing the, the fleet efficiency. Right. But if we are looking into a scenario, of, say it's a private infrastructure developer um, that are building the infrastructure for mixed use of business and private, business, then the objective function will definitely be different. Right? It's more likely to maximize profit or minimize cost. But that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I think we have one question in the chat box. It's from Ali Ben. Benu, uh, say thanks for the great presentation. Uh, in your research, did you also account for an observed heterogeneity due to the spatio-temporal factors? 
Uh, I'm trying to see the chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by unobserved heterogeneity? Mm. Ali, you can yeah. unmute yourself. I'm trying to unmute myself. So thanks for the great presentation. So actually, so in every research, there are many factors that is that are known for the researchers. and. There are uh, several other factors that are not uh, known, and uh, that uh, creates uh, unobserved heterogeneity, factors that we don't have any information. Uh, and some, some of these factors are related to temporal stability or spatial stability. So basically, do you account for those kind of factors? So uh, what I mean, for example, um, in terms of uh, um, spatial stability. So the case in New York is different from the case in Los Angeles or mm -hmm. from uh, other places. Or the case that we are studying today is different uh, from the case that we may study in 2000, uh, let's say 25, 2030. So there are some factors that we don't have any information uh, um, at this point. Uh, but we kind of need to adjust ourselves to deal with those kind of factors. Right, so that's a, a great point. So one thing I want to point out here is when we use historical records for modeling, uh, one thing we need to keep in mind is this is observed demand, right? Someone took the taxi and we recorded it. So first of all, there are unobserved demand. Right. There could be someone who want a taxi, but couldn't find one. So that demand is not recorded here. And the, the way we uh, address this is we are using this recorded demand as if it's our true demand, but we don't force all the demand to be served. So we allow some of the writers, if they didn't they would wait uh, a certain amount of time, exceeding their um, allowed preset uh, acceptable waiting time, they leave the system. Okay, so uh, that's why we compared the the, the, uh, the service rate. Uh, yeah, that's why our service rate is not at, you know, uh, uh, so this is relative to the base, right? So, but the base, in the base scenario, not all the trips get served. So that's one way we're um, addressing the, uh, the um, observed the demand. Now, for the other uh, heterogeneity you mentioned, there could be reflected in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what writers are using the service, their demographic information, um, their trip purpose, right? We have no information about those at all. And the way we're dealing with this problem is we're using uh, distribution to assign uh, the writers um, their tolerance level, because we don't know this writer, they, they have a commuting trip and they have very low uh, tolerance level. So um, because we have no information, we, we can only use the distribution to assign uh, to the writer, but we would run the model multiple runs to, assign, uh, to account for some of those uncertainties. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I think we have a, a next question from Professor Ouyang. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Tsai, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, very nice work. Uh, just uh, actually, I have a, a couple questions, but it should be really quick. First is, uh, uh, seems that your model is uh, dealing with uh, a static problem where we you are taking snapshots type of. Uh, I was actually just wondering if uh, if uh, the investment, which lasts normally a long time horizon, right, the next uh, several decades, would there be any dynamic decision making uh, that would make sense where you have already invested the uh, Certain amount of infrastructure that that so you are solving if you you currently you solve the problem statically like one mm. one one uh, you know one time <laughs> one at a time and then uh, what about putting them together as a as a, as a sequence of decisions so like a, you talk about pathway toward the future that would that make a difference do you think uh, that's one question if I may and the second question is that uh, you are solving the uh, AB uh, the agent based model and also the uh, the genetic algorithm in a sort of a iterative manner. Right. Uh, do you observe any convergence issues or that, that may potentially happen? Uh, uh, I'm wondering 
uh, in your experiments? Uh, right, that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I'll answer the second one first. So um, initially we did run into some convergence issue because we have very large search space given the amount of a candidate site. Um, that's mm -hmm. why we come up with this initial screening of better generate the initial sets. Um, that really helped the, the converge issue. And another thing we did is uh, we also did a, a future, right? If there's a nearby parking lot, if we're installing uh, the charging station at this one, right, it will not make sense to, 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 to do another one right next door. So we also have some uh, filtering that we added to improve the efficiency of the algorithm. Great. Thank you. And then the, 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 the first question, um, yes, you're right that we're solving this as a static um, um, uh, issue, right? Every development period, uh, we are solving uh, the, the problem once here, once here, once here, once here, right? Mm -hmm. I think making it dynamic will definitely uh, be uh, beneficial because a lot of things could change uh, in the middle, right? So. Um, that is uh, actually very interesting because based on our literature review, um, most of the, the, the citing problem are static. Um, not a lot of the problem are dynamic, but this, uh, um, this development will definitely be dynamic. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. It's a, it's a, the, the static problem is already challenging enough. I, I, I think it's just getting worse. Uh, but then <laughs> Uh, the, the, the the benefit potentially could be that if uh, you can preserve certain, you know, you know that something is coming in the future, you maybe the, the sighting in the earlier years could be a little bit different. Like you, you anticipate that, you know, the next step is coming like playing chess, you know that the next step is coming. No, just a thought, but it's very difficult. I agree with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> just a thought. Yeah, yeah, I think maybe adding like, you know, a prediction step in the middle, right, would be interesting. And then, you know, the, the, the actual, um, Adoption may or may not be the same as the predictor one, but that will that that dynamic process is very interesting to look at. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. Uh, um, I don't see any. Oh, there is another question from Ali Benmu. It's asking what are the advantages of agent-based simulation compared to other machine learning or economic methods in your research? That's a, also a great question. Um, so we choose to use agent-based simulation because it will give us the availability uh, to model each rider and each vehicle individually. So if uh, we go back to the, uh, the model here, uh, this one, right? Uh, we are essentially model each writer as an individual person, and then we can give this person or a traveler group their characteristics in terms of, oh, I'm okay to share and I want to wait for five minutes. And another person may uh, not be willing to share. Maybe another person is, okay, whatever service that come first, I will take it, right? So that will allow us individual preference um, that we can build in. Uh, on the vehicle side, uh, we, we could have a fleet with maybe four, uh, four seat vehicle, eight seat vehicle, maybe two seat vehicle. Um, so we can have some diversity here. Uh, when we are using more of the, the top down approaches, um, it's very likely that you have limited uh, choices in terms of a uh, 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 heterogeneous set. Uh, all the writers have the same characteristics or we have the same fleet size for um, very specific um, uh, group of uh, uh, fleet size. And for machine learning, it's more of a prediction process, right? Right now, we're uh, not doing a prediction. We're, we're not trying to learn from historical data. We're uh, doing more of a scenario analysis uh, based on different adoption scenarios what could happen in terms of aggregated system levels. So I think agent-based simulation allow um, the diversity in the individual agents um, to be accounted for uh, in order to understand the system level aggregated results. Great, I, I hope all of you, you find it's, the answer is also good too. So I think we're in the end of a uh, seminar prof, it's already 2 p.m. And thank you again, everyone, and Professor uh, Chai,
for the presentation. It's very a great uh, presentation, and we learned a lot of how the modeling from I believe it's more from the micro perspective of traveling, and then and how this three AV, EV, and then sharing readerships is like merging together in this our society. So uh, we are in the end of the seminar. Thank you again, Professor. Thank you very much. Yeah, and don't don't forget everyone, we still have a 